Welcome again. It's good to see you all here. My name is Teresa Longo. I am the Executive Director of the Reeves Center for International Studies. This event is part of the Reeves Center's Endowed Lecture Series. Many thanks to June McSwain for endowing this lecture, and to Kate Hoving, Diane Elliman, Tyler Lawrence, and Rocio Bresnahan for envisioning and launching the event. For reasons that will become very obvious in just a few minutes, the Reeves Center has been enthusiastically waiting for Carla Canales' visit. While we host a great many excellent events at this university, they rarely open or close with the kind of power and beauty you're about to see. Carla Canales' extensive professional accomplishments include her current role as Senior Advisor and Envoy for Cultural Exchange at the National Endowment for the Arts. She holds a fellowship at Harvard's Kennedy School. She has served as a US State Department Envoy. She has performed at the Sicily International Voice Festival and as a soloist in Fujian, China. I'm just scratching the surface of her accomplishments, but our time today is short and I want to give the floor to our guest. Please join me in welcoming Carla Canales, performer and advocate for the arts as diplomacy. so much I'm sure this is on thank you so much I'm delighted to be here and I want to give a special thanks to Kate for playing such beautiful piano thank you I'm gonna dive right in um, that was a piece by Federico Garcia Lorca who is a Spanish uh, playwright and poet but actually when he discovered that piece he frequented a lot of Spanish flamenco bars um, he was actually a student at a conservatory, and they had an assignment to create a new composition. And Federico brought in the piano vocal score which he created of this song. Of course, the teacher looked at this and he said, Federico, that's not an original composition. 
and Federico said, nothing I could ever write would be as important as preserving my culture and moved on to become a playwright. For me, I've been fascinated by the power of music since before I even knew what the word music was. As a child, I grew up mesmerized by the Spanish gypsy, Carmen, from uh, Bizet's opera. And there was just something about her that captured my imagination. Carmen was my favorite game to play. I would dress one brother up as a bullfighter and the other as the bull. And I would wave my imaginary castanets in the air and uh, chase my brothers around. So you can probably imagine my upbringing was unusual. Instead of going to football games, I grew up listening to operas and eating taquitos. This was my unique life, born as the first generation American in my family, the daughter of a Bulgarian father and a Mexican mother growing up in Michigan. <laughs> as a child of coincidence, rather than globalization, I had two vastly different cultures to learn about, but I had a new one that I had to assimilate to. I was a hybrid born into a state of cultural confusion. And the only way that I could really survive was by becoming a chameleon and learning to adapt to all of them. My dad soon placed his efforts on becoming more integrated into American society, but it was quite the opposite for my mother. She was determined to raise us as dual citizens with passports to prove it. And so began my trips back and forth to Mexico. I spent each Christmas singing posadas and breaking piñatas with my cousins. But I didn't really fit in in Mexico. Well, I was a foot taller than all of the other kids, and I had a funny Slavic last name. Coming back to Michigan wasn't much easier. In school, I had a hard time in English class. English was my third language, and I knew nothing about American football and still had a funny last name. My parents were pretty smart. They spoke no common language. And as the oldest of the three kids, I had the best English skills. So in addition to helping my parents with things like grocery shopping, I would constantly relay messages between them in Bulgarian and in Spanish. And so my fascination with communication was really born out of necessity. It's defined my life and impacted my everyday thinking. I was constantly analyzing how we communicate, and I try to find ways to make the communication process more efficient and more meaningful. And though I was doing it through language, I was keenly aware that words are just words. There's things that cannot really be translated because they can't really be put into words. These are things of the soul, and I think they're best translated through music. When I discovered singing, I was immediately captivated by just what a powerful tool this could be. Singing is the beautiful marriage of my two passions, language and music. And I knew immediately that I wanted to spend my life focused on this art form. Originally, I was drawn to opera for two reasons. The power of the human voice to project without amplification and the beauty that a human being is capable of creating with just their own body. I know that people mock the implausible plots, but to me, that's not really the point. The reason opera is so grand is simple. It's an art form that draws on the most complex of human situations in order to evoke catharsis. And opera achieves this by spending time on what affects us, the emotional peaks and abysses. It offers us a reflection of who we are, how we relate to others, and what it means, both collectively and individually, to be human. Don't worry, I'm not gonna spend too much time today talking about opera, but there is one thing on my journey as a singer that I have found to be true with all people, regardless of nationality or race, age, gender, ethnicity. And that is that we all have the capacity to feel emotion. It's our deepest universal. We all can cry, laugh, love, feel pain and embarrassment. We speak that common language, the language of the soul. So this is what brings me here today. I've come to understand now the many similarities between the work that artists do and the work that diplomats do. And I'm really interested in this work. Specifically, I'm interested in cultural diplomacy, which has been defined as the exchange of ideas, information, art, 
language, and other aspects of culture among nations and their people in order, and here's where it gets really cool, in order to foster mutual understanding. You see, there's an end goal to this kind of work, and that's very different from standing on the stage, performing or entertaining. I'll get to that more later. I first learned about cultural diplomacy probably in what would be the best way possible, and that was by doing it. I became a United States State Department arts envoy in uh, 2005, early in my career as an opera singer. I was invited to complete my first mission in Mexico. The program took place in a small city, Campeche, which is an area with relatively low tourism, especially at that time. <laughs> Given the immigration challenges, the US Embassy wanted to connect with underserved areas. And this was one of the first programs in this particular region. And as a community with a very large indigenous population, US government officials were working closely with Mexican government officials to better understand the demographics in that area. And while they were getting to know each other through meetings and discussions, I, just out of grad school, had this task of creating a program that would serve for that end goal of fostering understanding between the two cultures. The reality is that while diplomats have the best of intentions, I think artists are often the ones who create the actual programming through which the cultural diplomacy takes place. It's not an easy task. In some cases, we get briefed on foreign policy objectives, but in other instances, it's really up to the artist to, on their own, become aware of the history between the two or more involved countries. And in addition, there may be language barriers and cultural hurdles to understand and overcome. In this case, while I speak fluent Spanish and I even hold Mexican citizenship in addition to my American citizenship, many of the constituents of Campeche actually speak Mayan and or Mayan dialects. And many of the indigenous people were already skeptical of Mexican government officials, let alone American diplomats. So on the other hand, just as artists may not have an innate knowledge of foreign policy or foreign policy objectives, foreign service officers may not have experience with the arts. Many of the diplomats that I've worked with have relied on older models of cultural diplomacy, like the traditional touring model, we in opera call it the park and bark model, where you sort of park and bark, everyone claps, and then you go home. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I really believe that there's more possible through creative programming. You see, performing can often be like a lecture, which is what I'm doing right now, uh, with the performer sort of showing the audience something that they deem culturally relevant, often with a Western bias. And this can be thought-provoking, but a different approach with more preparation and perhaps what I think is especially important, more of a premium on exchange of cultural equity and values. That can be more effective because therein lies an opportunity for us to learn as well. So back to Campeche. While the team of embassy officials were planning the schedule, I wandered into the streets and I joined a soccer game with a group of youngsters. They seemed amused that I would want to join their game, but soon enough we were all laughing and playing together, and once we finished the game, I wanted to sing for them as a token of my appreciation. And to my surprise, they wanted to sing for me. So when the embassy team emerged, I told them I wanted to invite these kids on stage to perform in my concert. And over the next few days, the group rehearsed and we performed together, and the embassy worked with local organizations trying to use the arts to help their education processes. And those workshops and performances then led for that children's group to become a children's chorus. Would you believe that within a year, these young kids were performing with Andrea Bocelli, one of the world's most famous opera singers, for the state's largest annual concert? The next year, they were selected to win the Coming Up Taller Award, which they received at the White House in Washington, DC. Offering a presidential award to an underserved community like this in Mexico sent a very strong political message. One which, sure, in part, helped to ease the tensions related to the immigration issues. 
It also offered funding to that local organization called La Chacara, which is now a cultural hub that offers ongoing workshops and classes to the community. Not all cultural diplomacy missions are as straightforward and successful as that first one was for me. Uh, but then again, not all cultural diplomacy missions are planned. One of the most important cultural diplomacy missions, which led to our present relationship with China, was actually initiated uh, pretty spontaneously through an informal cultural exchange. From his first days as president in 1968, Richard Nixon had envisioned a connection between the United States and China as key to counterbalancing the influence of the Soviet Union. Achieving this would be a huge challenge due to the deep distrust between the two nations. Nixon's ideas about China were embraced by his national security advisor and later Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. But the moment to make the breakthrough just had not really presented itself. And that changed in part because of an unlikely meeting at the 1971 World Table Tennis Championships in Nagoya, Japan. Both countries had sent teams to the event and the event was presented with the slogan, friendship first, competition second. So what began as an event on April 6th of 1971 uh, had practice sessions and in, on an afternoon, the American player, Glenn Cohen, actually just missed his team's bus. He'd been practicing with a Chinese player and when they, shot to, they sought to shut down the facility, uh, Cohen was invited to board the shuttle bus with the Chinese team. And during that very brief bus journey, the Chinese players seized the opportunity to try to speak with Cohen through an interpreter, and they exchanged just a few gifts. The following day, Cohen decided to give one of the Chinese players a t-shirt with a peace sign on it, and the words from the title of the Beatles song, Let It Be. Well, when the photographers saw the two getting off the bus, it caused a stir. One journalist asked Cohen if he would like to visit China, and he said he would welcome the chance to visit. Of course, at the time, the country was close to Americans. Initially, the Chinese officials balked at the idea of taking a US ping pong player up on his completely unofficial expression of willingness to visit China. But later, their position was overruled by Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, and of course, the country's most senior leader. On April 10th, 1971, stunning the world, nine American table tennis players entered the People's Republic of China. And they spent just under a week in China playing ping pong and touring cultural sites. And of course, that, that visit bred enormous goodwill between the two countries. Nixon and Kissinger seized the moment. And after a series of negotiations, we know that uh, the historic visit took place of Nixon to China and one of those outcomes was that the Chinese ping pong team was invited to the US. So during his visit, Nixon noted that Chinese leaders took particular delight in reminding him that an exchange of ping pong teams had initiated a breakthrough. In US-China relations, Mao himself would co coin a more fitting metaphor, maybe some of you have heard it, where he observed that this was an instance where the little ball moved the big ball. And I bring this up because actually since my first mission in Mexico in 2005, I've had the privilege of working on State Department missions really throughout the world on countries like Chile, Honduras, Japan, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Montenegro, Peru, and others, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia. Um, but in particular, I've worked frequently in China. And I think that's likely as a result of this uh, ping pong diplomacy that happened. My first mission to China actually took place in 2011 during the Obama administration at a time when both countries were looking to deepen their relationships with increased support of people-to-people -people exchanges. For example, some of you may remember in November of 2009, then-President Barack Obama announced the 100,000 Strong Initiative, which was a national effort designed to dramatically increase the number and diversity of American students studying in China. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton officially launched the initiative, and the Chinese government strongly supported the initiative and committed to bridge scholarships for American students to come. But fast forward to now, the pandemic and increasingly adver adversarial relations have, of course, drastically reduced cultural exchange with China. 
several important US programs have been canceled during the Trump administration, including the Fulbright program with China, um, which was actually China and Hong Kong were the first countries to engage into the Fulbright program with the United States. As of June of this year, or I'm sorry, as of June of 2023, um, there were an estimated 350 Americans studying in China, down from some 15,000 just a couple of years ago. So indeed, a lot has changed since my first mission to China. The first time I went to China, I remember feeling like I was stepping into the future. I looked at some of the tallest skyscrapers I'd ever seen. I toured a half a dozen cities, including one that I'd never heard of, Chongqing, which is actually the largest city in China with a current population of 31 million. China is hurling into the future in ways that would stun many Americans. And there are reminders everywhere, public parks with virtual reality spaces, AI robots interacting with people in train stations, hotels and shopping malls, digital payment methods that make credit card and cash look like ancient relics. I know because I found this trying to buy souvenirs on my last trip. But even with all of the technologies and innovations that are taking place, I still feel like China is a place where human connection and emotion and friendship is highly valued. On my most recent trip to China, I learned of a concept. It's called zhiyin. The phrase is used to describe the person who knows you the best. The first character, zhi, means to know, and the second means music, yin. It's connected to this ancient story of Boya, a revered master of the instrument, the guqin. It's a Chinese sort of plucked string instrument. Boya longed to find someone who could truly appreciate his music. And one day, as he played, he heard a woodcutter named Zhi Qi say, oh, I understand your music. Zhi Qi likened his playing to the majesty of a mountain or the power of a river. When Zhi Qi died, Boya played his Zhi Yin instrument one last time, and then he destroyed it because he said he had lost his Zhi Yin, the only one who could understand the music inside of him. I learned this phrase from an unlikely teacher, an eight-year-old boy in Fujian province. His name is Huang Yiching. I met him last summer in June. He lives in a small mountain river town built around this incredible water mill in this picturesque river place. And when I saw him through this doorway of his home, he waved at me and I waved at him and his mother just very warmly welcomed me to their home, which was made of stone, and it had a small well at the center from which the family drew water. We gathered at their dinner table, and I chatted with my new young friend. Now, let me be clear, my Mandarin is basic at best, but he spoke surprisingly good English, and I suggested that we keep in touch to learn more about each other and practice our language skills. Yi Cheng is eagerly agreed, shaking my hand. When I learned he didn't have a phone, I wanted to give his parents some, some money to help buy him one, but they were completely reluctant. And as I Ching found my tour bus, my, my uh, fellow musicians and I were on a bus and we were about to leave the village, he ran to the bus and handed me a small gift, which was this incredible sort of replica of this village. And he said that he hoped that because I was a singer, I could be his Zhi Yin. Later on that trip in the city of Xiamen, the true meaning of Jian became even more clear to me when I met with Zheng Xiaoying, who is an influential 94-year-old Chinese conductor and educator. In 1962, she became the first Chinese conductor to perform at an opera house abroad. She was actually the first musician, Chinese musician, to do anything outside of China. Um, I was so moved to meet her. I sang for her from an opera that we both love, Carmen, and she would sing the passages to me in Mandarin. Music and the art allowed us to celebrate our common humanity. After leaving these new friends last summer and in light of the tensions surrounding the US-China relationship, I couldn't help but think, what could I do as an arts envoy? I have a full-time job now, 
as the first senior advisor and envoy for cultural exchange for the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. And I'm deeply committed to my work in Washington, D.C. and throughout our country. But I know also, based on experience, that there must be a way to use the technological advancements that have taken place since that first tour in 2011 to China. And actually, I've been really fortunate to be a part of some of those first forays uh, that our country has put forward in digital cultural diplomacy. In 2022, during COVID, I embarked on my longest mission, which was to administer a program that I had conceptualized called the Triple Threat Academy with the US Embassy in Jakarta. And I implemented it in partnership with the Jakarta Performing Arts Center. The program aimed to mentor and empower local artists to improve their livelihood and address social issues, as well as shape a more inclusive society. We started uh, in March of 2022 and went for seven months. The program offered training in three aspects of artistic development, traditional artistic training, advocacy training, and entrepreneurial training. It was the first program of its kind in Jakarta to use a sustained long-form educational model to approach all of these elements that we're talking about for individuals to become more well-rounded artists. Very different from the park and bark I mentioned earlier. Um, I'll get more into some of the details of that program, but I really want to tell you a little bit about the people I met. Over the time of these seven months, we had about 3,500 participants, and Indonesia, as you may know, is a country that's very, very spread out. Um, the islands are, are distances from each other, and we would gather very regularly, two or three times a week, on a Zoom link, and share our experiences, create new songs, and I learned very quickly that the impulse to be in community is at the core of Indonesian culture. I felt this despite being miles away in New York City and never getting to go to Indonesia. Though I never set foot there, the program made it possible for me to connect with so many incredible people. There was Maddie, a teenager with a voice that I promise you recalls a young Barbara Streisand. I've never heard anything like it. Who dreams of coming to study in the United, United States and Sakara Teja, already known in New York. She was uh, the runner-up of The Voice in Indonesia, and she would fit right in in Broadway. The first time I heard her voice, it perched right through my heart, and when I saw her on the screen, I was surprised to see that she wore a hijab. Many, if not most, of the female participants actually wore hijabs, um, and I learned that about 87% of Indonesians identify as Muslim. I also learned that many of the young artists in the program identified as LGBTQ, and the arts were a lifeline for so many of these young people as they left their own beliefs for a brief moment to play a character through these songs and plays. My students there taught me another term that stayed with me. It's gotong royond. Raka, Berti, and Karina, some of my students, explained to me that it's like a spirit of working together for one mission as a group. It's kind of the spirit of what Indonesia is as a country. Literally translated, goton royon means joint bearings of burdens, since gotong, especially in Javanese, means to carry a burden using one's shoulders, and royong means together or communally. I learned that actually public structures in the village, such as streets and even irrigation systems, are typically built via gotong royond in this cooperative system where resources and even money are pooled. Gotong Royan ethos, or collective work mentality, is also typically said for traditional communal festivities. It reminded me of potlucks here in the US. So through this exchange of knowledge, what if we here could carry this idea forth in other ways that would help our communities? Back to China, just last weekend, Saturday, a few days ago, I actually inaugurated this Triple Threat Academy in partnership with the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and the Zheng Xiaoying Opera Center in Xiamen with my dear friend, the 95-year-old now uh, conductor. The timing is especially good in that just this last fall, the United States State Department launched a global music diplomacy initiative that builds on our existing music diplomacy efforts and delivers upon a bipartisan peace act promoting peace, education, and cultural exchange. 
The act was signed by President Biden earlier in 2023 and promotes the exchange of programs for musicians with a special focus on supporting conflict resolution. From February to August of this year, we're embarking on this initiative. We'll continue to the work of the Triple Threat Academy with guests from the Metropolitan Opera, arts leaders from Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, as well as scholars from various universities. All of the classes are free of charge. And this time, I look forward to being able to travel to China to get to meet many of the participating uh, participants in the culminating events at the end of our initiative in Xiamen. As far as China and the US, they may seem very far apart, but I believe that our futures are deeply intertwined. And the world's destiny lies in our collective hands. In doing this work, I hope to bring together American artists, thought leaders, and arts leaders to learn from my Chinese colleagues, and vice versa. And perhaps, just maybe, other special connections, other Jiyin friendships may be formed. Well, although I've been fascinated by sound and music and communication since my journey began as an artist, I think that recently I've realized that what I'm really seeking is connection. And I'm driven more so by a strong desire to foster that mutual understanding. I believe that the role of any one artist is not to evangelize a culture. That would be propaganda. I think that the role of an artist is to facilitate the exchange of views and personal reflections within a community. To me, I define culture as a set of beliefs, and thinking about cultural diplomacy allows us a means to potentially change belief systems by learning from one another and then re-examining our own culture and what we believe. The key, though, is that exchange. When two or more belief systems are exchanged and analyzed and even re-examined, there's potential to actually broaden our own horizons. Often, we think of artists as entertainers in that park and bark model. But I think we can be more. I think that we can be educators and advocates and maybe even healers. Through the arts, we explore those things that cannot be said. And sometimes we face those delicate issues. In this way, I think arts can, just as Madeleine Albright put it, be a critical component to the foreign policy toolbox. And so I'd like to leave you with one thought. As an artist, I've often heard people speak of music as the universal language, and I see this differently. I actually think that our universal transcends language and reveals a fundamental trait of humanity, and that is that we each have that capacity to feel emotion, and that's what makes us human. The arts, what they do is they offer us a safe space to explore the depth and complexity of the human existence, of the emotions that come with our shared human condition. And yet, I think the real superpower for the arts is something even bigger. It's to serve as a gateway to something much more powerful, and that is to unleash the human capacity to imagine. It's when we unleash our imagination that the magic happens, that we can dream. And that's why I believe that even just one song has the power to change the world. Many people think of culture and the arts as being a luxury, but to me, there's nothing more essential than this. When we hear a song and we can imagine a better future, that is the most precious thing that we have as human beings. And that is why I believe that the arts have the capacity to advance positive social change. It's the underlying sense of humanity that reminds us that we're all in it together and we have a better future to look forward to. I'd like to invite my new friend back to stage. Um, Kate, thank you so much. And thank you for having me today. Um, this is very much a work in progress as I've gone on this journey from being a full-time artist to now um, really working much more in both the educational space and the, um, the government space. And I really invite the questions and the question portion here um, as an opportunity for me to also learn 
from you. Uh, but before we get to that, this is a song that's been with me since I was a little girl, waving those imaginary castanets. so much. Well, now I'm, I'm really looking forward to this part. Um, you know, as I said in the, in the talk, I, um, I'm always a little bit hesitant to lecture because I'm more, much more interested in the exchange of ideas, in the questions, in the conversation. So I know we have a little bit of time, and I'm really hoping that we can open it up to some questions. I'd love to hear what your thoughts might be around the arts and cultural exchange, cultural diplomacy. Yes, please. This is nice. <laughs> One of my best friends uh, across the country, he's aspiring to be a really prolific music educator, and I'm going to be involved in diplomacy. And I kind of wanted to know, what do you think can be done inside the United States itself to better manage that with, say, the children that are going to grow up in the next generation? Great question. I'm sorry. So uh, I missed the very first part. You said you had yeah. a friend who? Like music education. He wants music to teach yes. children. And yeah. I kind of want to work with him and 
you know, in the years to come, work on providing more cultural experience beyond the current education, mm, mm. especially because I'm going to be doing an international career, so I can mm. facilitate that. Mm. So how do you think we can better manage that societally? This is a great question. What is your name? Uh, Samkar. One more time, sorry. Samkar. Samkar? Yes. Okay, Samkar. Thank you. This is a great question. So um, there's so much I want to say. I want to start by saying, please get my email before you leave this room so we can continue the conversation. Um, I've never felt like there is a more relevant time to do the work of exchange on culture in our country than now. So we need you and your friend. We need that work to be done now more than ever. And it's part of the reason I, I feel honored to have joined the Biden administration because it's exactly what I get to work on and am researching. So I wanna say a couple of things here. Um, first of all, I, I have a framework for myself and I'll offer this because it might be helpful. Um, I think of the work that I'm interested in doing in four kind of buckets or pillars. One is traditional cultural diplomacy, which I see as having the goal of fostering the mutual understanding, but also with a goal of furthering foreign policy objectives. And cultural diplomacy traditionally is defined as work that is government-led. Cultural exchange does not necessarily have the goal of the foreign policy objectives, it does have the goal of fostering mutual understanding, and it can certainly happen even within the same street, the same block, the same community. Um, and then the two other ways that I think of this work are cultural awareness, and I think we're seeing a lot right now in the last few years on um, things like uh, this is Black History Month, or next month is Women's History Month or Hispanic Heritage Month. So sort of this, this awareness of um, perhaps underrepresented identities and learning more about their histories and so forth. The last bucket I see as being much more inward about cultural identity as it relates to oneself. And in my case, having a mixed background, that's been complicated. Um, the arts provide us a very safe realm to do work in each of those buckets. And while the last two, the last one is maybe in, inward, the awareness is maybe educational, knowledge-based, and the first two are more exchange, the arts can be the vehicle for all of those. There's a growing movement right now, which I'm watching with delight, of music schools, universities, um, including the work I've gotten to, to do some, some of at Harvard, which is teaching um, social impact through the arts. So how do you actually use the arts and create a program using metrics and measurements, uh, KPIs, UVP, all of the, the sort of business terminology, how do you apply that with an arts curriculum in a way that will generate results? And that's why I'm saying, please email me, because I have a lot of resources on this. And I think you'll find that most of the people that have been interested in this work, like myself, were a community that will gladly respond to an email, gladly sit down and do a Zoom session and talk with you and your friend and say, OK, where, what, how, how can we help? And it's one of the things I really want everyone here to leave with is a knowledge that if you have an interest in any of these areas, you are invited into a community of some of the most generous, caring people that I know who took me under their wing. And so it's very much, um, you know, it's, it's our honor now to get to pay that forward. Um, so I, that's, rather than take everyone's time up here, I will just say, A, that's super important work. We need you so much. B, there's a lot of resources for you and see you have a friend and an ally right now. So um, let's follow up. Great question. Yes, I, I see a couple more, one down here, yep. And what do you consider the highlight of your multiple careers and why? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, that's a hard question, I've never really thought about it. I think, um, the highlight of my musical career. <laughs> I've gotten to work with some really incredible musicians, um, people that, you know, by all accounts were superstars. Uh, my teachers, I 
studied with Shirley Verrett, Grace Bumbry, Montserrat Caballé, performed with Leonucci. If any of you know opera, these are some of the biggest names in opera. Um, but I think, I hesitate to say this story. Um, I had an experience in China doing Carmen, which was a very challenging and experience initially, um, and I didn't understand why. I was, it was 2013, and I was the only non-Chinese in the cast, and I didn't feel a lot of warmth in my rehearsals. Um, I had been doing other operas, there were international casts, it was a very different situation, but in this I felt not so good. And we got to the dress rehearsal, uh, the, the music dress rehearsal, and suddenly uh, there was a particular member in the orchestra who just didn't come in and the conductor cued him and he said, I don't play for Americans. And I, in that moment, understood. Like, oh, this is what's going on. But you know what? I have to say, I was there at the National Center for Performing Arts in China. The only non-Chinese, like, why was I there? Why didn't they have a Chinese Carmen? I'd never really stopped and analyzed my own role there, and I'd never taken the time to try to learn from them. And that experience really kind of set me on a very different course. In the end, I figured the only thing I could do was to try to just sing the best I could sing to have a good experience. And when we closed the show, I'll never forget, um, every single person had come out from the orchestra and the cast and sort of lined out outside my dressing room and they said, Laosha, and we're sorry. And, and it was a, just a tremendous moment for me. Maybe they had wanted to make my life difficult. I don't know, but, but we all bonded so much and I've gone back to perform with them many times and we realized that it really wasn't about nationality, it was about the music and just making great music together on stage. So even though that's not an example of maybe the the highest echelon of opera conductor, or, you know, the most difficult technical feat. It's probably the experience that shaped me the most because I understood the potential of what I was doing beyond the music. And that really reframed what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah, we have a couple questions down here. Hello. Uh, okay. The most likely sources of funding for the kind of work that you do, and this is, I'm making a mental connection to a previous lecture here at the college by one of our most well-known graduates, Bob Gates, who was head of the CIA Defense Secretary, and is our chancellor now. He used the phrase soft power, and he was describing the value of things like the Peace Corps that went way beyond the small individual contributions of a person, and I see this fitting exactly into the, what our country can do around the world with other, other countries with soft power. Where, where are the sources of money for whatever the forms of soft power are gonna come from? That's a great question. So I, I am very interested in soft power and have a lot to say about it. Um, there is a link or a parallel, let's say, between cultural diplomacy and soft power. Cultural diplomacy, as I define it, traditionally is government-led, government-sponsored, so it's State Department is running the programs, or other parts of the government generally run and fund these programs. Soft power is about attraction to a country without any kind of government interference. So you could, one could say, for instance, that America's soft power is high because of Taylor Swift, because Taylor Swift is so popular globally that that, and she's American, so that raises America's soft power. Um, if for anyone who's interested in soft power and particularly um, sort of looking at it from a measurement side, there's the Lowy Institute in Australia, I think does the best analysis on soft power and how to really take a look at um, what is making the difference in soft power. In terms of funding, you know, it's a very tricky question because this country has a real uh, non-government mechanism for these kinds of things, Hollywood, 
the Recording Academy, all of that, that's where I think the soft power for the country sits because it's outside of government. Um, I, I think the most interesting study of rising soft power is what's happening in Korea, in South Korea. Because within the last 10 years, we've seen now uh, the K-pop craze of that music, uh, the Parasite movie and, and Squid Games and all of these films and television series gaining popularity, beauty products, food, etc. And actually, that's a way that the world has gotten to know about Korean culture. And in that case, it was both strategic on behalf of the government and the not for, or the, or the, the um, non-government sector. So there was a partnership strategy there. I can tell you someone who works for the government there's generally not as much of a partnership strategy in the US, and that's for reasons that I think are just core to what America stands for, and the freedom of speech, the freedom of being able to, to you have any kind of artistic expression that you wish for. Back at the time of the Cold War, for instance, um, Martha Graham and others were asked to do cultural diplomacy, and they sometimes didn't want to, because they didn't want to feel like they were being utilized as propaganda. So I just bring that up because I think there is a fine line on how certain artists will see it and how certain artists will not want to be viewed as um, being used for soft power. Of course, we have a history in this country of jazz ambassadors, right? Uh, the wonderful work that so many of our jazz ambassadors did, Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong. And they did that work at a time where there were some real uh, racial tension in this country, um, and so that had its own challenges. But to your point about soft power, I think, I think America has a very, very strong history and legacy and um, sort of superseding interest, <laughs> culturally speaking, when it comes to film, television, music, fashion, everything that we sort of consider American culture. But how we start to really think about that as an export, how we start to think about the power of American culture abroad is something that I don't see as many people really analyzing and thinking about. We sort of think of it more in this country as the freedom of expression. In other words, to go back to the Taylor Swift example, I don't think she's, and I could be wrong, but I don't think she's thinking, oh, you know, my fan base in Japan is gonna help my country's the, the perception of my country abroad, she's just thinking, I want to make great music and connect with my fans abroad, probably. And so there's that authenticity element that actually ends up helping our soft power. So I guess what I'm trying to say is in the end, I think part of the reason America has such strong soft power is because of our commitment to freedom of expression and the authenticity that comes with that. And I really hope that we preserve that for as long as we're a democracy, it's fundamental. Great question. We got time for one more. One more. Oh no. Well, I'll be outside afterward if anyone <laughs> wants to. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. My name is Lana. I'm from this small Eastern European country called Georgia. Yes. It's right under Russia. Uh, yeah. So um, I have a question that pertains to kind of uh, open-mindedness in terms of the arts, because. Um, a lot of what I've seen after the war in Ukraine in my own country is that um, I guess uh, there's this um, hostility towards language and the arts and anything that comes from Russia and it's understandable but I also think that it's necessary to kind of um, understand the culture itself. I think it would be a great loss to lose the arts as a way to understand our own humanity. So how would you foster open-mindedness in a country that's seen a lot of repression from a different side, but also should still connect on a human level? That's a great question. What is your name? Lana. 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 It's a, you know what, I'm gonna give you a, a tough answer to that. Um, tough because it's not a Band-Aid. There's no Band-Aid fix. I think it's one person at a time. I think it's one grain of sand at a time. Um, Changing hearts and minds is not, it's not easy work. It's not work that necessarily comes quickly, but I really believe that if you use every opportunity you have in life, 
with an openness to that, whether it's holding the door open for somebody or having a conversation with the person sitting next to you on the train or wearing a scarf or, or a, a blouse that tells the story of something cultural and being ready to engage in those conversations. That's, at the end of the day, in my 40-some years on this planet, what I believe in. Um, I've certainly tried many different models and types, and, and I just think at the end of the day, it's like the young boy who I met in Fujian, who we sat there together, and that experience was undeniable for me, and I can't ever erase that from, I mean, I carry him with me, and I wanted to tell you about him, and maybe now you'll think of him. And I think it's the same, you know, if you can tell that story to someone else and that person becomes an ambassador for that story, that culture, and then they do it for someone else and someone else, it's really that sort of one grain of sand, one person at a time approach. But despite that being challenging, I can tell you that there are so many people that I think are really hungry for that knowledge, who really want that connection and I just encourage you to go for it and, and do whatever you can. And I count myself in those people that will be on your team with it. So um, thank you. I, I really wish that we could talk longer. I, I have a feeling it's, it's my time's up, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Many thanks to Carla. That was truly amazing. And actually, to all of you as well, the conversation that you started here is a good one. It's an important one. It's the kind of conversations we love at William & Mary. Thank you all again. Carla will be out in the lobby for a little while if you have an additional question.